Michael Croft, okay, building resilient teams and building a resilient work uh, force. So this is a great podcast. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and I remember sitting with you so many times in the cafeteria at the university and you taking me through the stages of development. And I'll be so excited to hear about the also the tool and the application. But I think I want to devote a good part of this podcast, understanding your journey, because that is for audience is the, the best thing, is that we are in a journey of resilience. And I think there is a lot in your uh, in your line, your family line, uh, in your network, in your in the previous work that you have done, you're going to explain to us. That is a lot to do with other building uh, communities building better people, resilient and uh, resilience. So, but I want to start with something from your uncle Norman. You know, you've written a book. We we're going to talk about the book in a moment, but in here you say something that your uncle Norman says, when you meet someone for the first time, ask something from the past week. I want to start with that. Can you tell us something about your past week? Oh, absolutely. But let me first tell you about my uncle Norman. By all means. Uh, he likes this. Um, he, he was somebody who, who left school at 15, um, the child of, of not a wealthy family. He left school at 15 and um, had to move away from home and was made an apprentice and be, became an apprentice engineer and eventually over time became a chartered engineer. And um, I, he was very proud of being a chartered engineer, but he, through that, he became an oil salesman and he was a, a, a gallerous, funny individual who always had a smile on his face and a laugh on his lips. And um, his world was full of stories. And um, I guess I learned from him that um, what really matters is the way human beings connect with one another mm -hmm. and laugh and share together. And are mm -hmm. also sometimes sad together, but in principally laughing together and, and sharing one another's strengths. And, Yes, Uncle Norman did say to me, um, whenever you meet somebody or whenever you're speaking to a group, say, let me just tell you a little story about what happened this last week. Uh, so perhaps I could share a story with you. It's about a man called Gerald. Mm -hmm. And Gerald is probably about 80 years of age. To look at him, he, he, he looks a very serious um middle-class Englishman with his tweed suit and his stern look. Um, but to, to talk to him, his, his, when he talks about people, his, his face breaks into a smile. And he said, he said to me a little while ago, I've never wanted to have an argument with anybody. I just want to hug them. Um, by which he means just affirm them and encourage them. And I, I saw him a few days ago and um, every time I see him now, I'm encouraged because he's an encourager. Wow. And, and I think there is some great strength in that. Years ago, I used to have a saying um, that I would share with people all the time, that you earn the right to criticise by first encouraging. And if you haven't got anything encouraging to say to somebody, shut up. Mm. Well, that is amazing. I think I think uh, a lot of people these days should take that <laughs> advice. Uh, we hear a lot of criticism. We hear a lot of there's a lot of pressure everywhere. And yes, I think encouragement is so key for resilience. Um, Michael, thank you so much for sharing that. I want to move that to talk about you are from God's own country, right? Absolutely. Yes, yes, I, I am. I am from the heart of West Yorkshire. Yes. Okay, uh, brilliant. I love Yorkshire. I lived that so many years. I had so many stories also from there. And I now live uh, mainland Europe, but I still miss Yorkshire a lot. Tell, tell us a little bit about yourself and your upbringing. You, can't, you have this family line, a lot of interesting things that you have to say. And every time I was always like amazed to, to hear stories. Can you tell a little bit about Mike? and about, about who course, you are. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I grew up in a, a village in West Yorkshire and um, discovered relatively recently, and my, my family are embedded in, in that village and in the, the nearest town, which is Halifax. And I, I learned relatively recently that um, my ninth great grandfather was a man called Jonathan Priestley. And... Um, he lived not 20 minutes walk from where I was brought up in a farm. Mm -hmm. 
and he was born in 1633 and wrote wow. a memoir in 1696. And in his memoir, um, spoke of the family going back to the conquest, by which was, was meant the Norman conquest, and um, spoke of his, um, his and my family heritage um, in and around that area, obviously going back to uh, 1066. Just amazing. But then subsequently, I, I've learned that he was what in 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 England we we were called in the 17th century a dissenter, so people speaking out of conscience in terms of their faith and their understanding of how the world works. And his grandson, he's my ninth great grandfather, but his grandson um, was somebody called Joseph Priestley, and Joseph Priestley. Um, many of your listeners may be familiar with his name. He was the person credited with um, discovering oxygen and helium and various other elements in the atmosphere. And with, I suppose, the father of soda pop. Um, but he was also a theologian and uh, an academic and a philosopher. And here you have an individual thinking for himself. Um, feeling empowered uh, to do that. And I think there's something inspiring about mm. the, the capacity for free thought, to, to dare to explore ideas and to invent and to create. For, the, for that, for me, is the, is the root of innovation, which has, has always been at the heart of what I have done as a person. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. that is that is a, a exciting um, and very interesting story. Also, but exciting to hear you saying that because in today's world, there is a lot of mistrust in a lot of the products coming to the market. We're going to get into products later on, but I think we see a lot of these people from the past and companies that are starting with the idea that would be redemptive to their communities. Correct? Yes. Yes, that's right. Contributing something positive that's going to kind of. Um, contribute to uplift in one form or another. I, 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 guess, I guess the Industrial Revolution in West Yorkshire, actually, where I'm from, is, is, is part and parcel of all of, all of that. There was a, a building built in the town where I grew up, or near where I grew up, called uh, the Peace Hall. Mm -hmm. And it was built um, in the 1780s um, for local traders who made small pieces of cloth in looms in their homes. And for 50 years, it was a, a point of, of trading and I, I guess enabled people to come together, sell their wares, and in that instance, uh, become the, the global center of the woolen trade. Mm -hmm. But it all started with individuals in their communities, weaving on, in their, on their looms in local villages, mm -hmm. and then um, coming together to sell their wares. And, and so I guess it, it, it all starts in communities, doesn't it? It all starts in communities. In all, I, so you are from uh, in the round or Halifax that you said? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, absolutely. I worked a little bit in that area also. Um, I visited a few mews. I mean, I was um, at that time uh, um, a consultant for businesses in that area. What, what is the name? Is it Calderdale Valley? Or what is the name of that region? Calderdale is, is, is the, the name of the, the, the district. The district, yeah. I think I worked in different, in that district, yes, uh, in partnerships. And I remember, and I knew there was a lot of heritage in terms of a community building and companies that started from there. I think that's York, Yorkshire. I mean, whatever you go in Yorkshire, we, we hear stories around communities also, right? And yeah. also people coming in from abroad to build uh, Yorkshire. Right, you know, different people from different people's group, different countries. So it's fascinating. And tell us a little bit about you and in involvement in community. I know you have um, some heritage in terms of theology and philosophy also. So would you would you call yourself a theologian, a philosopher, or both? I'm, I'm probably more a theologian than a philosopher, but I, I'm perhaps a theologian with an interest in philosophy. Um, I, I I love the, I love the root meaning of of the word philosophy or philosopher. Yep. A, a philosopher is a lover of wisdom. And, and I, I think everybody um, 
is to some degree or another a philosopher because we're we're, we're all seeking wisdom aren't we yeah, exactly um, and i think many of us who've got faith should call ourselves theologians because mm -hmm. a theologian is simply somebody who's thinking about god or mm -hmm. um, uh, spirituality or whatever um and we, we should have permission to claim those titles for ourselves, I think, sometimes. But you, you have, uh, I don't know if you have some formal training on that, but you have uh, worked uh, in yes. that uh, sphere. Yes, if, if I, I'm, if I'm, I'm, I'm not mistaken. I'm an Anglican clergyman, um, an Anglican priest minister, and um, uh, studied theology formally um, a, a, very, a very long time ago. And believe that very strongly that that my theology should be contextualized in and through my conversations with people and in communities. Um, the, theolo theology, our thinking about God, as it were, um, should be grounded in 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 real life and people's uh, exploration regarding who they are for themselves in their communities and if they're a person of faith before their God. Mm, absolutely. I we, we are like joining all the dots here. So we're going to get to the resilience, but help us to join all the dots. So from there, what is the link between that mic and the innovation mic? How, how do you connect the dots there? I, I sometimes say to people, um, I, I'm, I'm really, because you can tell by my grey beard, I'm quite old. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm 61. Okay. And I, I sometimes say to people that every job I've ever done since I was the age of 18 when I left school has involved um, a blank piece of paper. Um, it's as if wherever I go, I have a blank piece of paper. And I, I praise the memory and thankful for the memory of my parents who encouraged me to have ideas and to stand by them. And um, I think innovation comes from um, that blank piece of paper and our preparedness to um, let ideas collide. There's a very famous writer, um, Stephen Johnson, who wrote a fantastic book on innovation, who has a tagline, chance favors the connected mind. And, and I think that that's true, that, that um, innovation comes out of ideas colliding in context. And, and I think that uh, the, throughout my whole career, that's been the case. So um, when I was a parish clergyman, which I was for 20 years, working in some of the most challenged communities, um, what I was charged with was creating um, something new in communities. And, and we, we built a an enterprise network in communities and um, supported youth projects, um, work with elderly people, employment initiatives and so on. But that came out of me as an innovator, facilitating local people to have ideas and to have the confidence to see those ideas realized in action. And then after 20, after 20 years or so, the Church of England didn't really know what to do with me, I suppose. So they said to me, <laughs> Mike, why don't you go off and be a proper entrepreneur for a bit, which meant to be a private sector entrepreneur. So, so I, 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 I left unhappily in a way, because I, I, I loved being a parish clergyman in communities, but it was the right thing to do. And I left with one question in my mind. That question was, how do we build innovation habits in people? Mm. How, do, how do we do that? Because too often, it seems to me, um, People's ideas are, are squashed either by their background or through disappointments or whatever it might be. But how, how do we build ideas um, that can be realised in action? Um, so that was the essential question, really. Mm. Um, to build, how do we build innovation habits? That was the essential question I left parish work for. And I've, I've built my business so far based on seeking to answer that question mm, that's and I've ended, up, I've, I've ended up running a technology company yes i want to talk about that technology company in a moment but let's devote some time to your ideas 
and your writing. I mean, you how many books you've you've, you've, wrote, you've written one book so far? Or? I've, I've written one one book so far, but I I, I write constantly for work in various different ways. Mm -hmm. And and I think you like that aspects of that can be very inspiring to people also, right? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Um, so so the journal of brand item. Can you talk us a little bit about that? Yeah, you you refer to my book. The, it's it's pronounced Aiton. The journal Aiton. of brand. Barnaby Aiton. Yes. Brand, who yeah. is Brand? Is that fictional? It's a fictional character, it's, right? It's entirely, it's entirely fictional. Of, of course, I'm drawing on life, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's entirely fictional. Um, I, I wanted to. Uh, the, the whole premise of the book is this character called Bran Aiton um, has bumped into his his girlfriend from when he was a teenager, mm -hmm. and they've rekindled their friendship and and nobody knows in the book whether it's a romantic friendship or not mm. um but the, the 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 journal of bran Aiton is written in the first person so it's as if bran is reflecting on his life and it travels over over 40 days as he's reflecting on his life and, and what's brought him to this particular point in life and um he, he fundamentally asks the question about the distinction between I and me. In other words, uh, the I that's presented to the world and the me, which is the person inside. Mm -hmm. And th there's a constant exploration in the book between I and me. And it's, it's interesting. I, I chose the name Bran because in... Um, in kind of English and Welsh heritage, this character, there, there was a, a, a warlord, a Celtic mm. Welsh warlord um, called Bran. And um, it, by legend, Bran's severed head, this is a bit gory, Bran's severed head is, is buried under the White Tower of the Tower of London. And the, the name Bran means raven. And the reason why there are ravens in the Tower of London is really, despite all the legends, a, a, a legacy, a memory of, of Bran. Wow. So Bran, Bran stands as a kind of prototype character in the story, and it's the story of his reflecting on his, on his life and where he's come to. Mm, excellent. We, we're going to put a link uh, in the description of the video, also on the website, so people, if people want to uh, reach out to you and connect with you and also uh, buy the book, I think it'd be amazing. Uh, Johnson, by the way, said hi to you, and he wants to get, get hold of the book. Um, and I said, I'm going to talk to you now in the podcast. And uh, yes, so no, yeah, very good, exciting. Very, very good, just very good. email me for a copy of the book and I'll gladly send it. <laughs> yes, I will definitely. Uh, thank you so much for that. I mean, that even uh, takes me back to Game of Thrones. It sounds like almost like oh my god, you know th those stories. Uh, uh, when, when is the fiction a character? When, when is that? Is that a time period of time or? Yeah, it's it's con it's contemporary. Oh, is it? Um, okay. Um, so so it's well, you could say it's timeless, but it, it's it it's it's understood to be contemporary. The idea is that Bran is this person who on the outside is a, a very ordered individual and, you know, professional man, successful man, lives quite wealthy, everything is ordered. Um, whereas his, in the story, his former girlfriend is presented as um, chaotic, alcohol dependent, a, a little bit kind of dissolute in nature. But you learn in the book that actually the one who's chaotic is Bran and the mm. one who's ordered is his former girlfriend. OK, well, oh, that's a twist. Not, not, let us not give away more now. People <laughs> get hold of the book. Find out what's going to happen to Bran. Oh, there and are his girlfriend. <laughs> let us not let, let us leave it like that. Don't, don't give any anything else away. Let's let's leave the, the cliffhanger there. People want to get the book now. Um, fantastic. Mike, I want, if I could just jump in. I think that one of the questions that's at the heart of the book is, who are you really? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, it's the identity, isn't it? Yes. It's, 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 it's surrounded. I think we are living in a world where people like hang into all types of different trappings or ideas or concepts. But truly, what we're really desperate for is finding who we are, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yes.
yeah. Uh, so so that is that is very very key. Uh, I think one of the things that we are Michael here in the community in uh, resilient and momentum resilient life is we really encourage journaling. I think journaling is an amazing way to find more about who you are and to write your thoughts, write your feelings, to examine yourself. You know, I think all the greater uh, writers and motivators, I mean, Marcus Aurelius, which is one of my favorites, I just finished uh, a round of being reading quite a lot of meditations. I finished another, another round of, of his book now. But all, it's all that journal, isn't it? Ep <laughs> Epictetus, uh, Seneca, all of those guys are constantly journaling and writing. It is, yeah. I mean, going back to the days of, of, of Seneca, the, the kind of journaling tradition was described as what was called commonplacing. Mm -hmm. And at, at, at particular points in, in history, uh, journaling has been a, a, a significant contributor to leaps forward in the way people think and work in the world. I, I remember reading about the, the philosopher and writer John Knox, he, he wrote a whole book just on how you index a journal. Wow. It's, it's, it's phenomenal, you know, and you can think of instances, can't you? The, the one that comes to mind most often for me is, is Charles Darwin with his, his journal. Um, you know, had this discipline of writing down <laughs> nuggets of knowledge or new insight, and out wow. of that, um, new patterns are formed. Um, fantastic. I'd encourage anyone to kind of... No, absolutely. Them. Absolutely, uh, Michael. Let's uh, let's go into your business now. So you left. You said you left. The, the church said, "Okay, I want to encourage you to go and do something about your entrepreneurial side." So you left. Uh, was it two thousand? How back? How far back that started? Two thousand eight. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, so I, I continue a, a, an Anglican clergyman, but left my job as a vicar of a parish to mm -hmm. set up and run a business. Yeah. Right. And ups and downs. So you started from there and then you set up is that Innovation People? Is that the company? Innovation People in 2008, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, and from there, now you have something called Spice Framework. And for me, it would be interesting for us to, because that is about how you empower people in a workplace. But uh, tell us about the story uh, yeah. of, of that. How, how does it come to? to pass and, you know, come to birth. The, the, to birth. the story is, is that, that I, I left my job as a vicar, as a, a parish priest in 2007, and somebody very kindly gave me um, a very substantial training contract in their business. Mm -hmm. And the story is that the business was uh, a call centre environment and they had a, a staff turnover annually of 108%, and where 71%, as I remember, of their staff, their recruits, left within the first 12 weeks. So they, they asked me to set up a training program. Um, I, I ought to explain, I have a secular background in learning and development from before I was uh, ordained. Um, so they, they asked me to set up a training program for their new recruits, for their team leaders and their senior management team. And we deployed some community development strategies with that group of people and reduced their staff turnover um, by 40% in six months. Wow. And the, the contribution to their bottom line was significant. They reduced their recruitment team from, um, oh, forgive me. Um, okay. They reduced their, their um, staff complement in recruitment from five to three. Um, and set up a talent development program for their um, UK business and US business in consequence. And my business innovation people was set up on the back of that, that contract because they were saying, this, this is amazing. How do you manage to reduce staff turnover so quickly? Mm -hmm. And that raised um, further questions beyond how do we build innovation habits to look at how you build um, effective teams for collaboration, how you focus on talent acquisition and capitalising on talent opportunities with people. And those were the kind of core questions at the heart of what's become the SPICE framework. The SPICE framework is a, is a way of understanding how people make decisions in context. And then out of that, we've been able to develop it as a 
specific digital product in its own right that really anyone can can buy. Mm. Uh, what, what is the, the can you can you tell us a little bit about why Spice uh, Framework? What, why did you choose that name? Is there any story? I'm not knowing you. There might be a story. Yeah, there's a story. There's always a story. <laughs> um, <laughs> Spice is an acronym. Um, for um, S for strategy or for our, our rational planning strategy, uh, P for patterns, the way we perceive patterns in the world, um, I for the individual, C for the context in which they operate, and E for emergence or what actually happens. And we can break that down further into two pairs, really. So there's the S for strategy and the E for emergence, what actually happens. You could say, well, that's the conscious rational mind and that's the unconscious of, of the emergence. How do, how do they work together um, to realise something good or sometimes not good? But what's regulating that? What's regulating, influencing the decisions that are made? Yes, it's us as individuals, the I, but it's also the context in which we operate. You know, you might think, well, some, sometimes we operate in a, a toxic context. Mm -hmm. We've all had organisations that are, um, or come across them that are dysfunctional. Or sometimes it's a very wholesome context where there's lots of affirmation and support. So it's, there's two pairs, the S and the E and the I and the C, but then they're brought together in the P, the way we perceive patterns. You know, whether we see um, patterns that are, uh, are, are positive and creative or whether we see patterns that are maybe negative and destructive mm -hmm. and so much of, of that is how we as individuals um, and but that look that that within the environment the working environment correct in looking yes. at an individual but not taking them away from that environment to a clinic but looking at within the environment of work but most of us spend most of our time in hours in a workplace we we do we do there there, there was um there was a writer and political commentator um years ago called edmund burke and edmund burke uh, in advised government in england um around about the time of the french revolution um and he he was to use modern language he was interested in this particular part of his work on promoting community cohesion and, and he argued very strongly that attention should be paid to any group over and above the nuclear family. So you could say any community group or any work-based group to build cohesion. So you say to yourself, well, context matters. I, I say in some of my university work sometimes that context is everything. Because, you know, we might do whatever psychological profiling we like, and we might look at any strengths profile we like. But unless we're interacting positively with our communities, we're, we're going to miss the mark. Because mm -hmm. fundamentally, I guess that people are, um, we're a hyper social species, aren't we? We need one another. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So we need positive community environments in which to thrive. Mm. Yeah, I, I believe, I, so I'm, I'm doing a lot of uh, study on, on because I'm, I'm producing a material around peace now. And I mean, more than ever, we need to understand the meaning of it and how we build resilient communities by implementing peace strategies uh, inwardly and externally. But that also comes into the, the work environment because it's very crucial to establish that inside a working environment. Yeah, it, it's interesting that there's a, there's a part of the Old Testament in the Bible where the, the, the prophet Micah, who's a, 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 someone referred to in the Bible as a little book, dedicated to him he talks about people crying peace peace when there is no peace and and three generations later another prophet in the old testament rehearses micah talking about peace and you know we we, we can't go about pretending that that there is peace when when there is none um but we should be working for it exactly and, and absolutely and um i mean drawing from different sources including rabbinic uh, uh writings at the moment but i mean, understanding how the greeks um see it you know the irene uh, peace in greek or, or pax in latin or uh, you know how shalom for the jews 
you know, uh, Salam for Arabics and, and, you know, Muslims, but they all come from the, the point of wholeness, isn't it? They yes. come from the point of, of living a whole, a total life, an established life, a foundational life, that from there everything built, is built. And without that element, it's impossible to have, let's say, uh, a, a healthy mindset or a healthy mind, healthy yeah. Habits and behaviors. One in six people in the UK, according to the Mind uh, Organization, Mind, you know, charity, one in six people every week in England are claiming some sort of mental health problem. That is really like, I, I tend to say now, talking to Johnston, saying that I don't know how you see it, uh, how not you, but how people see different, whether you call it a pandemic or a pandemic. Uh, whether you see that is man made or, or, or it was just by default. The fact is that the biggest pandemic that we are all living is the mental health pandemic right now. Where affect, it doesn't matter whether you're vaccinated, not vaccinated, you had COVID, don't have COVID. It doesn't matter, none of that. In our community, what we focus is that mental health. How do we move forward? How do we build resilience? How do we bring people together and live a better life and make better decisions and, and live an empowered life and it doesn't matter what happens around you, but we need to be able to come through this time and being better human beings. And that's my position in I, it. I, absolutely. I completely agree with you. I, Aristotle, in, in his wonderful little book, um, Ethics, which, which you can download for free uh, from the internet, the philosopher Aristotle um, really talked about people living purposefully and what he meant by that was people seeking the good in in the way they were living, and I, I think I think that that's um, I, I was brought up with two words as a boy. Um, the the one word was synderesis, which is is looking to to live to to seek good. Um, the other one is acting out of conscience. Um, will my action do good to other people? Um, or at least not do harm. And I think that one of the difficulties we've got, in, it's my view, um, in society is that um, to, for, some, for some reason, we seem to have um, forgotten um, about a moral architecture in society, which is about doing good. And I think this, this is leaving people isolated and I think when people are isolated, they're more likely to become vulnerable. And um, for those people who are less resilient than others, um, they're likely to be harmed. And, and that for me fundamentally is wrong because really and truly all human beings, whether it's uh, me to you or to Johnson or whoever, we all belong to one another. Mm -hmm. um, and and we, sh we should seek the good, it's a moral, yeah imperative wherever we come from no absolutely i agree entirely with you uh michael let's uh, with the time that we have now let's talk about spice framework you know how how do we bring spice framework into that context and and i think the premise of the business is about building people right better working environment i think you said, said there is something about build a uh, hive of connectivity can you explain across organizations and teams etc can you explain what do we mean by hive of connectivity and how can that help resilience in the workplace? Uh, I'm delighted, yeah. We, 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 we've turned the, uh, the SPICE framework that we created from our research into a technology platform. And that technology platform is there to connect um, the assessment of people, their, their strengths and potential um, to their development and to then the measurement of change in behavior and impact on performance. And that's all done within the context of, of teams. Mm -hmm. um, so an individual can go and access the SPICE framework, set up a, a team, um, but then they can connect teams. So an individual, let's say it was you, Andy, you could be a member of one, two, three, or four, or however many teams. Um, so each individual can connect to a range of teams creating a kind of network, uh, we call it a hive, of, of connectivity. So it's, it's using a digital space to create environments 
for development and for performance management that, that connect. Um, it's not about control and direction, although certainly you can uh, put together development plans and undertake task management, but it's about saying, hey, how can we use this digital space um, to connect people in a positive way um, for their development, even though they may not be able to meet together um, because of the pandemic or whatever it happens to be, but how can we create this digital space that's positive for people working together and growing. Mm -hmm. And are there some yeah. elements of gamification also or empowering people? Can you can you take, talk yeah. to us yeah. about we, that? We, um, going back to 2012, we did some work with Sheffield Hallam University who um, thought with us about how we could best develop the SPICE framework and commercialize it, frankly. And their commendation was that we build a platform that was mobile friendly, so a mobile first platform, and thereby build a platform that was game-based. So using game-based thinking, they call it gamification. I think that language is beginning to run its course. Mm -hmm. um, but it's basically about how do we create a platform that is very simple and engaging and based around um, symbols, um, rather than lots of words that people can um, enjoy using. Mm -hmm. and, and I noticed that um, there's quite a lot of, um, yes, icons and it's quite very intuitive. And I mean, we're living in that TLDR generation too long, didn't read. People don't want to read a lot or write a lot oh. or don't have time. So it's very intuitive the way you can move across different pieces and uh, share in, yes. And, and, and that also enables the workflow, but also people development. Can you, can you explain that link between the workflow? Because I've, I've tried and used, and I still use quite a lot of workflow management tools. Yes. But, but your tool connects workflow management with people development. Yes. Um, there are lots of very good workflow tools out there, and uh, you, you'll know and your listeners will know about Asana and Trello and Confluence and all these different products that tend to have been developed out of, in, in my estimation, a, a practical workflow or progress management uh, problem. They tend also to be, to be desk-based, so they, they tend to have emerged from a desk-bound environment or a, a laptop screen or something. So they're a pragmatic response to managing work. Um, we came at it from another direction. We came at it from um, the standpoint of, of developing people in a mobile environment and thought to ourselves, well, actually, whilst it's all well and good to develop people for their own sake, wouldn't it be great if we could demonstrate that that development of that individual has had an impact on their workflow? Um, on their productivity. And so we thought to ourselves, okay, well, let's build into our development some tools to actually manage workflow and some tools whereby we could um, API our development tools into workflow tools. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're going to, as it were, start from people, you have to very soon ask the question, well, what are those people going to do? And how are you going to measure that in terms of evidenced productivity and effectiveness? And so, so that was why we, we began to link the development of people to their workflow and productivity. It's well, just a logical step. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that integration is very key. It's very important because it's not only uh, work centered, but it's uh, a whole individual centered, isn't it? Yes. It, it takes in, into consideration the individual, not necessarily the, the actions or the tasks uh, that they have in a day-to-day -day life. Um, I, I have a couple of two questions that might be a bit challenging, but I don't blame you because that is what is in your uh, literature. Uh, one is that um, you want to create an impact in changing world. What, how do you see spicy, SPICE framework? creating that impact and changing the world. Let me tell you a little story. Okay. Um, there was a man called Roy, and um, the year was 1978. And I, I was a very mischievous 18-year-old who was not very good at work and um, 
I, I was very naughty. I nearly lost my job. And um, Roy was the training officer uh, for the employer that I had. And Roy um, stood by me and believed in me. Mm. And um, I, I think that I very much want to develop something, a platform that could be a Roy, um, mm. could, could be used in a very affirming way to support the development of people. Now, don't misunderstand me. Um, I know people have to perform. I, I know there are limits on what people can and should do. Um, but we need, I think, to create affirming environments that um, create impact, are positive. And Roy stands out in my mind as an example of that. In fact, let me tell you, years later, I heard my father and my brother um, talking about Roy, and I had no idea that they knew him. And um, my brother also was a vicar. And my brother was a vicar of the church in the area in which my father grew up and my grandmother lived. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't got a clue, but Roy and his mother had been members of that local church, but more particularly, Roy's mother had been one of those welcoming people that accepted all the children of the area to her house. And my father remembered her warmth and acceptance. And I think that that was passed on to Roy, that was passed on to me, that has been passed on to the SPICE framework as, as a, a resource that hopefully will contribute a positive impact in people's lives. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and the second question is, uh, Mike, in terms of building better teams, resilient teams, uh, improve workplace, in the experience that you have, now since you launched the prod product was it last year when, when did you it was earlier this year that we actually launched it oh, okay it's very it's recent cool. right yeah yeah. yeah yeah um what what is the feedback you have from from the different people that are trying or using the tool right now do you have any story or anything that can actually I, energize I, our audience with well I, I'll, I'll give you one in particular we're, we're um we're just about to sign off um a letter of intent um to work with some people who are working globally um, on a range of projects um, that are about supporting people mm -hmm. across cities and nations in various different ways. Wow. Um, so it's caught their attention. Of course, the product is new. Of course, there are only a few instances of its use, but it's just amazing that there's that interest in it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I was with somebody this morning who um, was previously sales director of a major uh, assessment business in internationally. And he's going to start using the SPICE tools as part of his work in business, supporting individuals. Um, and there's, there's a, a, a range of clients who are starting to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just so gratifying. Of course, it's, it's challenging. It's a new product. Yeah. Um, on one level, why should anybody listen to me? Mm -hmm. um, but um, what I'd say is don't necessarily listen to me, but look at the effectiveness of this. Play with it. Use it. They can use mm -hmm. it free for 28 days. See how it works. Wow, absolutely. That's amazing. And um, we will probably get all the links with you. Uh, so we can put in a description and people want to contact the company or try uh, or book a demo. I don't know how you work exactly, but please uh, let's uh, talk offline and we can get all this information because I want uh, our uh, community and those people who are interested in this tool uh, or even improving their life in the workplace, you know, improve their workplace experiences and resilience and build better teams and develop people. And I'm sure your, your uncle Norman will be proud of you because you're helping people to tell better stories. <laughs> <laughs> and also to, well, to so. and and also to write a better week, you know, week week in week week out, and then we can actually start writing a better week for us, you know. Yes. Um, so th thank you so much, uh, Mike. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate. Uh, as you as usual, we have a great time when, when we catch up and we talk. And uh, it's been a pleasure. 
Yeah, I, I want to encourage you guys, if you are uh, watching us now, please subscribe, like, share with uh, people, friends and family. We want to build and grow the community around resilience and we're always bringing ex excellent um, guests here in our podcast. Thank you very much. And we will uh, see each other soon. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure.